So we're very fortunate to have here uh, Daniel Kitaro this week, who will be giving the first uh, special assignment of the uh, Daniel has had many awards given over the years, uh, first the uh, Walker Prize in 2002, and most recently, uh, he received the Science Investigator Award. So we're very ha happy to welcome him here. We'll be talking on JFC on the other ways on Black Hole Thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. But it took me a while until I was able yeah. to, uh, to honor the, the invitation. Um, so, uh, what I will tell you about uh, is, uh, uh, well, obviously, linear uh, partial differential equations. Uh, it's also uh, connected to, to relativity. So, and so, it will be essentially a mix of, of the two topics where I will skip from one to, to another area of that. Uh, my collaborators, uh, Jason uh, is uh, at uh, Chapel Hill, uh, Jacob at uh, San Gabriel, and I was my student uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so, uh, before I uh, get to, to uh, Move the slides. I want to show you a little bit of a motivation for uh, this uh, problems. Uh, to, to tell you why I think this these problems are interesting, and then I'll tell you what uh, we can do and what we want to do about that. So maybe a good starting point is with the from the Latin standpoint with the vacuum Einstein equations. So here we have. Uh, a Lorentzian space time of 3 plus 1 dimensional manifold with a metric G of signature 3, 1 and uh, R denotes the Ricci tensor. And uh, as I said, these are the vacuum Einstein equations. If you're not a big fan of uh, general relativity, then you can think of this as a nonlinear wave equation, which in a suitable coordinate frame has the form of G applied to the matching G, so it would be something that looks like ray and the G this way. Oh. Uh, and one of the, uh, let's say, initial topics in, uh, in uh, general relativity was to, to, to find uh, special solutions to, to the Einstein equations. And some of those uh, special equations are very simple. For instance, we have the Minkowski space time. So D S square. But also, you have more interesting examples of solutions to, to the Einstein equations. And those include, for instance, uh, uh, the Spark cell metric. And the Schwarzschild metric, I'm not going to write down what the metric is, but I'll just say that this describes a, a, a spherical symmetric black hole. And then, uh, as a generalization of the Schwarzschild metric, you have the Kerr family of metrics, which uh, represent uh, a black hole which uh, is not no longer spherical symmetric, instead, it has a part a little bit of spin. Uh, and so, it's, it's a rotating black hole. Here we have, uh, if you try to characterize the Schwarzschild space time, uh, there is a one family of space times defined, defined by a scaling parameter, which is the mass of uh, uh, the black hole essentially. It's different. Yeah. Hmm? It's different in the space time. It's different, yeah. <laughs> um, it's trying to keep the guys on your toes. Then the first space time we have two parameters, so the same mass as before, and the angular momentum A. And uh, maybe instead of trying to write down one of this uh, space times, I'm, I'm going to, to try to uh, draw a picture here. So um, maybe every time you, you try to draw a picture of uh, a black hole space time, a good thing to start with is what is called the event horizon. Which, uh, in a suitable coordinate frame, looks like a cylinder. Uh, so I'm not going to be drawing any general uh, diagrams uh, today either. 
um, because I, I prefer a setup which is invariant with respect to time translations. And so if you look at the event horizon, uh, the way you, you should see this picture is the following. So uh, the ver vertical axis is T. Right? Vertical axis is T. Uh, horizontal axis is X, both of them. Um, oh, it could be a little more, but from here. Um, and now if I want to show you how a uh, space time looks like, then uh, an interesting thing that I can uh, put on this picture is how the light comes originating at any point in the space time looks like. And if I'm at the point outside the black hole, then the light cones will be essentially uh, vertical. And they become quite, quite vertical at infinity. And then if you approach the uh, event horizon, the black hole, they begin to bend a little bit. So that at the point where you reach the black hole, the light cones are uh, tangent to, to, uh, to, to the event horizon. Uh, toward the inside, and finally, if you move a little bit farther in, and so on here, then your light cone is fully pointing inside. All right. Now, just to pick this picture with the light cones is not everything we care about in here. Um, also, we care about how how light propagates. Uh, what are the light rays in this picture? And precisely, we care what are, what are all possible patterns for, for light rays. Some light rays will escape to infinity, obviously, so might have some, something that moves away to infinity. But more interesting in this picture are the light rays that don't go away to infinity, that are so-called trapped. Right? And in this picture here, you're going to have more than one kind of trapped rays. Uh, you're going to have, first of all, some rays that travel along this event horizon. So let me draw one, maybe something like this. Alright. Uh, and this, this ray uh, uh, spins uh, around the event horizon, again in a suitable coordinate system, and uh, the spin is uh, commensurate with this angular momentum of A. And finally, uh, outside the black hole, you're going to have some light rays, which I'm going to call the trapped light rays, which still spin around the black hole, but without touching it. Uh, so maybe something like that. Let me, let me use a different power coding for this. Okay. So, so this, this also goes around the, the black hole. So, in the simplest picture, uh, the case of a Schwarzschild spacetime, uh, this uh, trapped rays outside, you can think of, of them as the rays which uh, are all always tangent to a sphere. Uh, that's what's called the photon sphere. And then, if you take more complicated spacetimes, then when the dimension of this uh, set of trapped rays in the the phase space remains the same. Uh, its uh, projection in the physical space somehow will look more, more complicated. So this is the picture that we have in mind for Schwarzschild and Kerr space times. And uh, one thing that I will not do in this talk is specialize any of the results to, to such metrics, but rather I want to think of, of uh, general black hole space answers as my uh, best sense. Alright, so we have these two special solutions to the uh, Einstein equations, the Schwarzschild and the third. And one very simple question that one can ask is what about the stability of these two solutions? So stability. have a nonlinear problem, uh, you can think of stability in more than one way. And of course, the, uh, the best thing to try to do is to try to look at nonlinear stability, right? But if nonlinear stability turns out to be uh, very difficult 
question, which is the case here, then uh, it, it becomes uh, just as interesting to look in a first approximation as a linearized stability. Okay? Linearized stability means you take the Einstein equations, you linearize them around one of these solutions, your uh, solution of choice, and then try to see if you have uh, a good uh, decay estimates for these linear weights. And in here, you could, uh, if you want, you could come up with a hierarchy of problems to look at. The simplest problem one could look at is the scalar grade equation. Which is box G of some scalar function P is equal to zero. Or if you want, you can uh, play a little bit more with this, add an electromagnetic potential, add a potential to this, but it will still be an equation for a single real or complex variable. Uh, a more involved model, uh, which uh, for instance arises uh, uh, in uh, when, when you look at the Degrees of freedom in choosing coordinates for uh, the Schwarzschild and Kerr matrix is the Maxwell equations, which is five on the electromagnetic field. And you can write this in more than one way. I'm not going to write them down right now, but I'm going to uh, show them to you to later. Uh, what's important here is that you have an electromagnetic field. F that you're trying to describe, and you have essentially uh, three independent equations. Uh, and because of the many ways that you can write the Maxwell equations, these three independent equations could uh, reflect into a four dimensional system with one uh, degree of gauge freedom, or a six dimensional system with uh, three degrees of gauge freedom, uh, but the number of independent variables is three. And uh, finally, you can look at linearized gravity. Where you look at, at the actual problem of linearizing the Einstein equations around the Schwarzschild or Kerr space time. And here you're trying to describe a metric, and the metric uh, in uh, uh, three plus one dimensions is going to have uh, 10. Uh, components, but those components will be connected. With, uh, essentially, you're going to have uh, uh, four degrees of freedom, which are connected to your uh, uh, choice of coordinates. So you have ten minus six. Ten is the number of elements of uh, symmetric tensor minus four, uh, number of coordinates that you can choose. So you're going to get six if you want in the pattern. So, um, within this uh, hierarchy of equations, I'm going to uh, tell you about the estimates for the first for scalar waves and for the Maxwell equations. Can I just ask a very naive question? Yes. I don't have a novice in this subject, but so when you say you want to linearize around a solution, you mean you, you fix the manifold in which the solution lives and you try to linearize the equation in that manifold? So what I would do is I would look at, uh, let's say, uh, small k denotes the curve metric, right? And then I would look at solutions uh, for the Einstein equations, which uh, look like k plus a small perturbation delta k, right? And then I'd like the first order equation for this small perturbation, so I get some linear operator which depends on the background metric k, which applies to delta k is equal to zero. With, with the Einstein equation, you're also looking for a manifold, right? So here, how will the, the manifold is fixed? He's, he's, he's just fixed looking the manifold. Yes, first order for it. Okay. 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 So the, it, but the, uh, the stability question you're asking is uh, a bit vague right now. So if, are you asking, you're going to put in these uh, matter source terms and look at the, the, the Einstein equations with matter? Or are you going to, and you're going to, or are you going in a linearized gravity equation? There you're, you're, you're going to be looking at the original equation. All right. So if you if you think about uh, a linearized equation, there are no source terms in here. On the other hand, from the perspective of doing PDE estimates, 
uh, you cannot really study the equation, just the homogeneous equation. You also need to study the equation with source terms because one needs to do a lot of also perturbative analysis. So in fact, the first two problems, the first two equations you mentioned are simply prototypes to hope. So you hope to get uh, in, in something about the linearized gra gravitational equation and use the first two as prototypes? You can think of them as, as prototypes, but uh, you can also think of them as equations that uh, describe certain components of uh, uh, the linearized gravity. So for instance, if you take uh, uh, the linearized gravity tensor and you look at the trace of it, that will solve a scalar wave equation. You can track it. Yeah. So, uh, you can think of this as understanding smaller bits of your, your big equation, right? Um, so, but in, in, terms of the, in, in terms of the stability question you want to ask, is it that if you have uh, a perturbation within it, say, uh, compactly supported initial data, that it should then die off after? Exactly. So, one example maybe of what could imagine to be a stability statement would be I take a parametric, I take a small compactly supported perturbation, and then the contention would be that at infinity, your solution will converge to some other parametric. Not the same. Because you're looking here not at the single uh, equilibrium state, but at the family of equilibrium state. So then the natural concept you talk about is that of orbital stability. Right? But what you don't want to happen is that you totally lose control of the geometry at infinity. Maybe the black hole disappears, and maybe it expands to uh, cover everything. Um, so, so then your, your space time becomes uh, some sense of function. But I said I didn't want to draw kind of diagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. But for these equations, I'm going to look both at the homogeneous equations and the inhomogeneous equations and look at the uh, uh, DKS limits. Now, uh, looking at black hole space times, uh, let me, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll draw a little bit more on this picture. But before you actually get going on black hole space times, it's perhaps useful to have a, a simpler example in mind. So, uh, when, uh, in my talk, I'll uh, look at first this uh, 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 simpler class of space times. Uh, which are called uh, non-trapping space -time. So, in non-trapping space -time, you have no black hole, so the black hole disappears. And furthermore, all of the light rays go away to infinity eventually, so you have no non-trap rays. Other than that, the features that I wanted here are the fact that you have a metric that's asymptotically flat, so you have the Minkowski metric and you have a metric that looks like the Minkowski metric at infinity in a suitable sense. I'm not going to be very precise, but uh, this is something that you can take as a guideline. And within this context, I'm going to care uh, especially about stationary space times. And once I understand what happens to stationary space times, I also want to allow slowly varying space times. Space times which vary with respect to times, but just a little bit. And this is, uh, in some sense, consistent with the uh, stability question because we expect your space time to converge to a fixed space time at infinity. Alright, so uh, this would be my non tracking setup. And then uh, here is my uh, black hole space time. So I have uh, uh, my time slices which serve as initial value. Uh, well, I have an initial value slice for my wave equation, and then at further times I can measure energy on subsequent time slices. Uh, and so, in order for this to work, you need this foliation uh, to be uh, space like foliation. And then, uh, one thing that's uh, interesting in this picture is if you take a, a, a very specific space time like Schwarzschild or Kerr, this in suitable coordinates, the, the event horizon will look like a very nice sphere. You can write down explicitly what it is and work with it. However, if you take a perturbation of one of these space times, then the event horizon is no longer, if you want, a locally defined object. Uh, and in fact, the event horizon begins to depend on, on what happens with the space time at infinity. All right? uh, which is why, instead of solving the problem, outside the black hole, 
I'm going to take a smaller cylinder in here. All right. And I'm going to solve, so here are the light points point inward, and I'm going to solve my wave equation outside this smaller cylinder. So this cylinder serves as a useful threshold uh, strictly inside the black hole, and if I do this, then perhaps I will not care exactly uh, where the black hole is. I will know that there is a black hole uh, somewhere between this cylinder and some exterior cylinder. All right, so my other features are the event horizon, which I uh, uh, just uh, drew here in purple. On this event horizon, at each point, I have the null geodesics that move along the horizon, and uh, maybe the tangent vector to this null geodesic is what I would call L. This is a, a generator, if you want, of, uh, of the null flow that's tangent to, to the event horizon. And then T here corresponds to the trap geodesics that are outside uh, the black hole. And one important thing to keep in mind is that um, this uh, trap trace which are outside stay completely separate from the uh, black hole, at least in the context of uh, uh, that I'm considering here. In relativity, there are also uh, black holes which don't have this property, which are in some sense extremal, uh, but I'm not going to uh, touch that uh, complete at all. So I'll, I'll assume that there's, in some sense, a non-degenerate uh, event for that. And here's uh, two very simple facts about uh, the wave equation. First, the way uh, it's, it's written, you have a second-order hyperbolic equation, with a Cauchy data, which is the initial position and the initial velocity. And the first thing that one, maybe one of the first things that one learns, the kind of mark who teaches the TDE class, is that there is an energy momentum tensor associated with the wave equation, um, which is divergence free. So once you have a, a vector field X, uh, which is a killing vector field, that means that your metric is. Uh, uh, Independent uh, of uh, is, is invariant with respect to transport uh, along the x vector field, then you can produce a conserved energy. So that's maybe the first step in establishing good estimates for your wave equation. Um, and you produce this conserved energy by integrating this divergence equation and uh, using the Stokes theorem. So you have your initial energy on an initial slice, and that, that will say that would be equal to final energy on your final time slice. Now, this is a good thing to have. However, when you look at black hole space times, this energy will not stay positive definite. So it has only a, a, you can only get a limited use out of it. In uh, the non-trapping case, the energy is uh, one up in the energy, and it gives you a nice conservation. All right. So. Um, now, what do I mean by PK estimates for the wave equation? And uh, maybe even before we get to, to PK estimates, the uh, uh, last item that I had on the previous slide was energy estimates. So uh, the first thing really that you'd like to be able to say for a wave equation is where, what, whether you have uniform energy estimates. In other words, whether you have a uniform bound, which says that u at time t is more than a fixed constant times u at time zero. Once you know you have a nice problem like this, then you worry about the decay property of the solutions to the wave equation. Now keep in mind that if you take, for instance, the wave equation with constant coefficients, then you have a conserved energy, right? So uh, then you have equality here and with no constant. So you expect energy, at least in some asymptotic sense, to, to, to stay more or less preserved. So on one hand, you have energy that's preserved. On the other hand, I'm saying that I want to look at PK estimates. So what are these PK estimates? And I will show you three classes of PK estimates. One, which is called local energy decay. I'll describe that in a moment. Then the streetcars estimates, which have proved uh, very useful in the study of nonlinear wave equations. And finally, uh, point-wise decay, which is a decay which has proved uh, very useful in the study of nonlinear stability problems. And 
I will, I'll try to give you some uh, idea of the, the flavor of the results that uh, we can obtain for uh, in terms of this uh, different kinds of DK methods. So uh, one thing that we'd like to understand here is not only whether this property is called in very specific space time, so that we know, for instance, that they all hold very nicely in Minkowski space time. Uh, we also know that they hold in Schwarzschild space time and perhaps also in Kurt, but we want to understand what are really the geometric properties of the space time that govern such decay properties. Uh, and we want to do this, uh, if you want, in two layers. First, I want to look at stationary space times where I can do a little bit of spectral analysis. And then I would also like to understand what happens when I'm looking at time dependent perturbations of. Uh, uh, stationary space times, and again the reason for that is because that's the kind of space times that one expects to have to deal with in uh, nonlinear subunit problems. Alright, uh, so if I am to, to draw a picture for you, what do I mean by, in, in the most naive way, what do I mean by decay for the wave equation? So if I take the standard wave equation in the Minkowski space time and I start with some localized initial data, then this data will spread into a solution that will be supported in, uh, in a problem, more or less, right? And uh, the finite speed of propagation will tell us that our solution will be zero outside a lifetime. And then if you're in the Minkowski space time, then Hilbert's principle will also tell you that the solution is zero inside a lifetime. And then on the pump, your initial energy is going to, to get spread, right? So you're going to get some point, pointwise decay along the pump. And the pointwise decay that depends on the dimension, but in uh, three space dimensions, your solution will be decaying essentially like one over p, right? Now, we don't care so much about the constant coefficient wave equation, and uh, not all of these features survive when you move to variable coefficients, even less of it survives when you look at black hole space times. One thing that remains valid, though, is the finite speed of propagation. This is still a wave equation. So outside the light cone, you expect your solution to still be equal to zero. Inside this light cone, you will no longer be equal to zero, but perhaps it will have some decay. And one interesting question that you'd want to ask is what is the decay inside the light cone? So this is in terms of point-wise decay. Well, the local energy decay and three class estimates are, again, different stories, and I'll show... So if you were to ask the same question in odd number of space-time dimensions, you wouldn't have the Huygens in, in the cone for the, for the, uh, for the standard wave equation. So, so this is sort of a... a one point key place where you want to use the fact that? Uh, yes, so uh, you, in you, some sense. Uh, so uh, if, if I were to look at the uh, uh, even space dimensions, then uh, uh, you'd certainly not have Hilton's principle in the simple picture. Uh, but uh, even there, you'd expect some effect of this tone to spill inside. Uh, and that would be on top of uh, whatever fundamental solution you have for the constant coefficient wave equation, right? All right, so uh, before I, I show you what this DK estimates are like, I um, wanted to emphasize two, two different uh, sources of difficulties when you look at the DK. Uh, one difficulty has to do with the uh, uh, sort of spectral nature and has to do with eigenvalues and resonances. Uh, in particular, uh, eigenvalues you can look at, uh, suppose your operator box G is a diagonal operator, uh, dt squared minus Laplacian and G tilde, that's uh, is a special Laplacian. The eigenvalues for this uh, operator will play a, a significant role, and then we can define similar notion of eigenvalues that are adapted to uh, space times without having to have uh, such a uh, diagonalizable structure. Uh, and resonances uh, are eigenvalues uh, 
1 and p, which have less decay at infinity uh, and are still enemies in terms of decay. So this is what happens in terms of low frequencies, the cyclical resonances, you think of them as very smooth objects. And finally, the other difficulty has to do with, with trappings, namely that not all of the light rays uh, either go in the black hole or go to infinity. And whenever you have a, a light ray that's uh, concentrated, that, that stays in a compact set, you can think of high frequency solutions that follow this light ray. And so they never escape to infinity and never decay, possibly, at least in the first approximation. All right. So uh, my first slide here is about uniform energy bounds. And I was telling you uh, this means that you want to have a bound where the solution at time t is uniformly estimated in terms of the solution at time t or so, the implicit constant over here that does not depend on t. And if you happen to look at the problem where the coefficients don't depend on time, you can take the time Fourier transform, okay, and then you get here uh, some uh, operator where tau is the time Fourier variable. Uh, so you rewrite this equation in the Fourier space, and then you get to talk about a resolvent operator, which if uh, you are in a in a product case, it looks like this. So you're looking at resolvent bounds, resolvent estimates for uh, the Laplace operator. And so uh, there's a very simple computation. But what is, what's the norm that you're using? So here okay. I'm using the energy norm. So uh, the L2 norm of the velocity plus uh, uh, the standard of the, plus the gradient of the position. Okay. Um, and so you can rewrite such an estimate again if you have a stationary space time in terms of bounds for this resolver. And the bounds for this is not. This is not that you can think of it as some sort of uh, uh, coming from a, a Fourier Laplace uh, transform of, uh, of, of the solution. Uh, and a priori, it will be defined uh, in a, in a uh, half plane uh, where imaginary part of tau is smaller than minus m, or m is the uh, exponential bound for the solution. But if you have to have uniform bounds, then you should be able to push this resolvent bound up to the uh, real line, okay, with uh, bounds which are proportional to the imaginary part of your spectral parameter to the power minus one. So if I have to make a picture here, make my spectral picture. So this is the real line. Tau is my uh, time frequency. And then the region where I'd like to have a resolvent tau is on the imaginary, on, on the lower half plane. And the bound that I have here goes up as I approach the real line. Okay? Now, one obvious obstruction to having uh, resolvent bounds and implicitly to having uniform energy bounds is if you happen to have eigenvalues in this. So, every eigenvalue that you find in this lower half space corresponds to a solution that grows exponentially in time for your weight equation. And if you have something like this, you're going to have no decay of solutions to the weight equation. Uh, now, how about local energy decay? And one thing that I wanted to show you on this first slide is the original uh, estimate of, of uh, Moravets, so that was maybe in the 60s or 70s, early 70s. Um, and what this estimate tells you, let's see, here on the left, you have uh, an energy, so the gradient with respect to x and the uh, uh, t of uh, your solution t is like an energy of the solution. But instead of integrating this just with respect to space, you integrate it with respect to time as well. So I will do a picture for you. You take the cylinder. radius r, and then within this cylinder, I'm integrating the energy. And 
I'm claiming that this is a measure of decay, right? So if this uh, energy, which is the gradient of P, uh, is square integrable, that means that in, in some sense, the energy decays to zero within this cylinder as you push time to infinity. So this is not uniform decay, but it's average energy decay. Um, and I was just telling you before that the energy is a conserved quantity, right? Uh, so what, what makes it decaying here? Well, that's the fact that you're looking at localized energy. Uh, and the energy decay in the sense that uh, most of the energy will move, will move out, and within this uh, cylinder of choice, you're going to have uh, a fixed amount of energy, uh, an integrable amount of, of energy. And now, what, where does this factor of r to the power one half come from? Well, we're talking about the wave equation, and the linear waves move with speed one. So if I have a cylinder of radius r, then one linear wave will spend the time which is proportional to r inside this uh, cylinder, which means that I'm integrating this energy, which is essentially constant, over a time interval of r. That's all there is to, uh, to this uh, uh, Moravec's estimate of local energy decay. And so that's why you have this constant in here that depends on R. And the proof, Moravec's proof of this uh, estimate uses what's called the positive commutator uh, method. So P here is your color version. And what you do is you uh, multiply the equation by uh, what's called a, a multiplier. Uh, this is a self-adjoint operator, this is a skew-adjoint operator. So in the computation, you end up with the commutator of those two operators. And the trick here is to choose your multiplier uh, so that uh, your, your, uh, you choose your multiplier Q so that this uh, commutator is positive to that. All right? And what I wrote down here is the simplest multiplier you can think of, but then one can fiddle with it further. So this is how your, your local uh, energy decay in the Minkowski space time. And so what uh, one can do is you can define what, what are called the local energy norms, uh, which I want to apply to my space time, where instead of looking at the single cylinder, I take a family of cylinders, a dyadic family of cylinders, and I'm looking at local energy within each of the cylinders, and then I'm taking the supremum over the cylinders. That's all that this uh, uh, local energy norm does. And now if you want to look at the inhomogeneous wave equation, so if I want to look at the equation of the G, U, is equal to L, then I need also a space to put my inhomogeneous term in. And that's my dual local energy space, which is exactly the dual space to the local energy space here. And this is how uh, a typical local energy decay estimate looks like. You have your inhomogeneous equation, and you measure your solution in a local energy space. You also want to measure it in energy. And in the right-hand side, you put the initial energy, and the right-hand side in a dual uh, local energy space. All right. And so, um, if you have a stationary space-time, so you, you see that I'm always trying to go back to stationary space-time, so whenever I want to do any spectral uh, description of, uh, of the estimates, uh, then this local energy estimates, I guess, will reflect into an estimate, uh, which is uh, uh, an estimate for the resolvent, which looks a little bit like the estimate on the previous slide, um, with one difference. In this estimate here, which is a pure energy estimate, my constant in the uh, in the estimate goes up as I approach the real axis. On the other hand, uh, here the constant no longer goes as we approach the real axis. Indeed, it stays uniform up to the real axis, which means that if this is the whole, you will also have some estimate on the real axis, some resultant estimate on the real axis. So if you want to get local energy or local energy decay, that's a stronger statement than getting energy estimates in some sense because you're also pushing your resultant estimate onto the up to and including the real axis. Okay? And 
once you hit the real axis, then just as we had this enemies decided on that is before, here you can hit enemies on the real axis. Okay? And this enemies on the real axis is what I'll call embedded resonances. Embedded because they are on the real axis. Resonance is because they are weaker objects than eigenfunctions. Eigenfunctions, the dice that we hear, are smooth and decay exponentially at infinity. On the other hand, these resonances, they will not decay exponentially at infinity. They will uh, decay at the, at the polynomial rate exactly at the 1 over r rate. So your uh, resonance will look like something like um, let's say 1 over r e to the power of 1 over r. Okay? So we have uh, on the Coulomb EK, and then uh, the oscillation that corresponds to the time frequency. Now one special kind of resonance is the resonance at, at 0, where uh, this uh, oscillatory phase disappears, and uh, that takes out of the problem one key factor here, namely that when you come from the lower half plane to the real line, then the resultant that you get is a resultant which satisfies a certain boundary condition at infinity, and that's what's called the outgoing radiation condition. This is a classical condition in, in a special theory, if you want. And that tells you that when you solve the resultant equation, you're only looking at waves which are moving outward as you go forward in time. You're never, you're, you're selecting exactly those waves and you're kicking out all the waves that are moving um, inside as you move forward in time. Okay? So, uh, you have two enemies here to worry about. One are these eigenvalues and uh, these are, uh, in some sense, much simpler objects because these guys either exist or don't exist. And if they exist, it's a compactness argument that tells you that they have a lot of regularity and such. Or, but, but these guys, they have a lot less decay and they are a lot less stable. So ideally, you'd, you'd like not to have them at all, not to have to contend with such uh, opponents at all. all right. And uh, the other thing that I was uh, telling you before is oh, this uh, item that is they kill your energy estimates. And this resonances will kill your uh, local energy decay. Well, I can make this even stronger. The resonances also will kill your energy estimates, but in a different way. The eigenvalues correspond to uh, solutions to the wave equation that grow exponentially in time, whereas the resonances will correspond to solutions to the wave equation that grow polynomially in time. Polynomial at a very specific rate, at a certain power of t. Okay. All right, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll skip this slide because it repeats some things uh, that uh, I said before. But there's one, one thing that I want to keep from, from this slide. Namely, uh, I was telling you before that you have this track trace. And I might have high frequency uh, wave packets, if you want, that move very close to such a track geodesic. And maybe you could say they'll stay uh, in a compact set infinitely in time. And then you have no local energy decay because the energy stays in a compact set. Right? And there's one mechanism to defeat this. And this is uh, what, what you see when you look at the linearized, linearization of the Hamilton flow along this track line trace. And what's important is that that linearization turns out to be, in most cases, hyperbolic. And this helps you in the following way. Suppose now that instead of thinking of a solution that moves along this ray with an arbitrarily high frequency, I fix the frequency of the wave. So I have a wave packet that's moving here. This wave packet has a frequency lambda. Well, once you fix the frequency of the wave, the uncertainty principle will tell you that the wave has to also be spread a little bit spatially, right? So you can't start, you can't stay exactly on this line. Even from your starting point, you have to have a little bit of spread in there. 
But this means that when I'm looking at the Hamilton flow, I'm just I'm not looking at a single ray anymore, but I'm looking at all rays that emanate from this neighborhood, right? And so it's not only important what happens to the single ray, it's important what's happening to the neighboring ray. And this hyperbolistic condition tells you that nearby rays, at least a good portion of them, will spread exponentially away from your original ray. So this neighborhood here, which is given by the uncertainty principle, is very small. It has size maybe lambda inverse. But given enough time, even this very small set will spread, and your wave will, instead of staying concentrated along the geodesic, will begin to decay. And so that's, that, there's a name to that, that's what's called the RMFS time, so logarithmic time, up, let's, let's call it here, log lambda, up to at, at which point you begin to see the, the waves at frequency lambda, your, your best candidates for, uh, for making trouble if you want to uh, spread out. And so when you look at the local energy decay estimate, what you're going to see in it is simply a law, a very weak logarithmic loss that happens just along this phase. So this is a sort of a, a technical point, I don't want to dwell much on it, but this is what happens when you look at uh, this uh, race that uh, that uh, uh, stays outside the event horizon. Okay, that's number one. And number two, there are also these other rays, the orange ones, which are moving along the event horizon. And this is where there's a very different decay mechanism. Uh, and that's what uh, physicists call the redshift effect. And mathematically, what the redshift tells you is that as your wave is moving uh, along this uh, uh, this ray, its frequency will decrease. So even if your wave is very, if your initial data is concentrated at the very high frequency, as you move up, its frequency decreases, and then its uh, spread must increase by the uncertainty principle until you reach a point where the wave is no longer localized. And so, um, that's another mechanism for decay. So you have two mechanisms for decay. You have, here you have hyperbolicity. And here you have red. So, I'll uh, skip this slide with the street arts estimates. This is about average decay because I want to get to, to the point where it's decay estimates, which is what I was trying to show you earlier on this picture. Um, and um, so, remember the discussion that I was uh, having before. What you'd like to decide to, to figure out is what is the decay of your waves inside the compact set. Right? And in particular, what you'd like to understand is what is, what is the uh, decay of the wave uh, around the black hole. And uh, Price, uh, Robert Price is a physicist who did some uh, heuristic computations that was in the 70s, early 70s. Um, and what he o observed, his computations were done by looking at uh, uh, the Schwarzschild space time and by looking at the spherical symmetric solutions. And what you observe for those very special solutions is that as you move up in time, in here, you're going to see a t to the power minus 3 decay rate. You couldn't explain so well uh, what was the, the reason for this t to the power minus 3, other that it came from a computation that he, he did. Um, and, uh, well, uh, this mathematically has become an open problem, and there was a lot of work in trying to to get this t to the power minus 3 decay rate, and lots of people have worked on it, uh, and lots of partial results, t to the power minus 1 minus epsilon, t to the power minus 1, t to the power minus 3 halves, and so on. Um, so this is sort of a scalar wave equation on a Schwarzschild background with non-zero mass, or? Yes, exactly. Could mass be negative even, or? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, but, you, I mean, we still have to have the black hole, right? Uh, if you make the mass negative, but at infinity, you could make the rest of it easier. If you're a mathematician, you don't care so much of that. But just to get a number for mass zero, right? 
This will not be no, 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 If you put mass zero, you have the Minkowski space, and then there's no eigenvalues to that zero, so it's direct. And if you want an interesting question here, is you have you have somehow two features of the problem. One is the entire geometric business around the black hole, uh, and the other is the asymptotic flatness at infinity. And the interesting question to ask here is what governs the decay rate in a compact set? Is it the action that happens in a compact set, or is it the uh, asymptotic flatness at infinity? And the correct answer, which is maybe a little bit counter counterintuitive at first, is that it's really the asymptotic flatness at infinity that governs the decay rate for the solution in a compact set, right? Um, what happens with the action that happens in a compact set, the action in a compact set governs the fact of whether you have decay at all or not. So compact action, either you have decay or you don't have decay. Once you have decay, the asymptotic flatness at infinity gives you the correct decay rate. And this was observed first by a, a Polish mathematician, Bisson, uh, when he did his own Bisson. Yes, he did some numerical computations and he looked at a very simple problem. So you're saying that the decay rate at spectral infinity, if you're assuming that it's, it's, that it's you have a. Right, so I'm looking at the metric G, which is Minkowski, plus something which is uh, order 1 over R, right? And here, this is where the mass would come, right? right? Uh, and let's say that the mass is non zero. And this term in here is the one that determines the decay rate even in, uh, uh, along the uh, black hole for, uh, for solutions to, to the wave equation. Okay? Um, so maybe this is one idea to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, I see I'm, uh, I don't have so much time left, so what I will try to uh, show you are, are two classes of results. One, my, my first class of results has to do with uh, the way you look at these different kinds of decay and try to understand what's important and what's not. Okay? And the results that you see on this slide uh, tell you about the following idea, that the local energy decay, okay, I try to explain to you in this picture here, is really the central concept that one needs to look at in terms of decay. And once you have local energy, and, and the local energy decay is intrinsically tied with, obviously, with what happens in a compact set. Once you have this local energy decay, everything else follows. So, uh, some work that I did with, uh, with Jason Matka years ago, uh, tells you that if you have uh, uniform energy and local energy decay, then you get those street cards estimates, those average decays. And more recently, a theorem that I proved a couple of years ago in the stationary case, and then with my collaborators in the non-stationary case, says that once you have energy balance and local energy decay, then you have this price loss. So, in particular, this, this uh, one thing that we were able to get out of this is to prove this, uh, this price will to give a, a complete proof of it, and not only to, to show that it holds, but also to show that it's uh, uh, the optimal uh, decay rate for, for this uh, black hole space time. So it's really the, the mass term in here that, uh, that governs the decay, regardless of whether you look at all solutions or just at radiant solutions. Okay, so this is one uh, thing that I wanted to, uh, to show you. Um, and maybe uh, on, on this uh, other slide, I wanted, I wanted to show you some, some spectral results. So, uh, in terms of spectral results, and, and, well, these are really results in the direction of local energy decay. And one result that I had with, with, also with Jason uh, years ago says that if you take a small perturbation of Minkowski, then you have local energy decay. Not very relevant to what I told you so far, except that it tells you that uh, this is, a, if you want, a stable phenomenon. Um, and then this spectral characterization of local energy decay, which says that if essentially if nothing bad happens, then everything is good. If you don't have these enemies, these negative eigenfunctions, then if you don't have these zero resonances, then you have local energy decay. So it's a spectral characterization of local energy decay, and this spectral characterization 
um, calls in the stationary case. And one, one uh, important result in here is a theorem that goes back to Kato, um, which says that these resonances in here do not exist. Okay? This theorem of Kato uh, does not apply to black holes. Kato did not uh, concern himself with the black holes, but it, it applies in the non trapping case. So all that uses essentially is a, a, an intrinsic self ejectness so of the elliptic operator that you're looking at, and then you show that there are no zero resonances. Now, one can extend these results in many ways. Hackmon did some work. Uh, I did some work uh, years ago with uh, Herbert Hoff. Uh, but this is the, the, the main idea. And then what you say this proof would work if you have a time like field, or something? Yeah. So, and, and then, but you have to do some extra work when, when you're cutting the. And now, so, so this would work in, <coughs> for stationary metrics whenever you don't have a black hole, right? And, and then the, the next interesting question is if you can eliminate these resonances also when you have a black hole. And this turns out to be a much harder uh, thing to, to, to buy, so to speak. Um, because uh, you have to concern yourself with what happens on the event horizon or inside the, the event horizon. And one result, which you're going to see that the background here is is Zach and Weinstein, right? No, not Zach and Weinstein, not right. Uh, but one, one result, which uh, I think we can prove it, but there are still things to, to be checked. This is Jen work with uh, Jacob Sturmans is that the same kind of theorem that you see here also holds for uh, black hole space times with one additional assumption. And this additional assumption, uh, for those of you who are uh, know a little bit more about relativity, is that uh, not only that your space time is invariant with respect to translations in time, but also your space time space time is invariant with respect to one dimensional family of rotations. In other words, that you have a second feeling factor. And one reason this is interesting from a relativistic standpoint is there is some there is a theorem which says that good relativistic uh, space times do have this second uh, feeling vector field on the event horizon. Okay, um, so uh, that's one thing that we're working toward now, and the second thing that we're working toward also with the Jacob Servants is to extend this family of results from the case of stationary space times to slowly varying metrics. So instead of looking at a metric which is independent of time, I want to take a metric which varies with respect to time, to time but very slowly, and then get the same kind of results. And this is work in, in, in progress. It's a, here it's written as a theorem. It's a theorem in the non-trapping case, and it's work in progress in the black hole. Okay. And um, I think I have another 11 slides to show you, but I'll, uh, I think this is a good time to stop.